فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم الذي ارجو الله تعالى I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala an yudhibahu anni bi fadlihi wa karami that Allah removes this illness from my eye he is the one who is virtuous and he is the one who is kind and generous ala ragmi min hadha even though I have this illness with my eye and my time being tight and all of the other reasons faqad badartu ila tahrir hadhihi ar-risalati al-qayyima I sat down to bring this risala and do tahrir on it. Tahrir means verification, authentication, accurately writing it. ثم قد, ثم and then I gave this book to him, the, the individual as a gift. أسى أن تكون له so it can be for him ولغيره and other than him ممن أسى أن يقف عليها those who I hope might stand over this book that they benefit from it. عونا على طاعة الله that he benefits them in what way? That it's a means to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger في هذه المسألة in this issue which is a hijab. This the hijab التي تهون بها في هذا العصر أكثر الناس the majority of the people have taken the matter of the hijab very lightly, he said. And they've disregarded its importance. وَفِيهِمْ Amongst those people who have taken it very little and they belittled its, its concept. وَفِيهِمْ كَثِيرٌ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْعِلْمِ Majority, and amongst those people are a lot of people of knowledge. And people who attribute themselves to knowledge have started to take the matter of the hijab and the jilbab of the women, they've started to take it very lightly and disregard it. المفروض فيهم أن يكونوا قدوة لغيرهم Those who it was obligatory on the ummah to follow them. These ulama are role models for the people. And they've taken it and neglected the importance of the hijab of the women. في كل أمر من أمور الشريعة They are role models in every matters of the sharia. People are following them. Every ruling of the religion, the people would follow them. So, sorry, فَمَا بَالُكَ بِغَيْرِهِمْ Then what do you think of other than them? If the ulama and those people of knowledge have disregarded and become negligent towards the affairs of the hijab, and these scholars are role models for the people, the people are following them in the matters of the religion, then what do you expect? فَمَا بَالُكَ بِغَيْرِهِمْ Then what do you think of other than the scholars? حَتَّى نَدَرَ The Sheikh said it became very rare أن ترى في هذه البلاد that you see in this land which is Syria من وقف عندما حدده الشارع فيها كما سترى It's very rare that you find in Syria somebody who has stood over what the Sharia has said pertaining to the hijab as you're soon going to see The Sheikh then says ولكننا نحمد الله but we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala على أنه لا تزال that there's always going to remain طائفة a group of people من أمته from his أمة even though this is the problem we know that there's always going to be a group of people who are steadfast قائمة بأمر الله they are steadfast upon the commands of Allah لا يضرهم it does not harm them من خذلهم أو من خالفهم it doesn't harm them those who oppose them and those who deceive them حتى يأتي أمر الله until Allah's command comes وهم and they are راهرون على الناس and they are apparent over the people this hadith is what the shaykh uses the hadith is Bukhari and Muslim that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he told us the shaykh said even that though before I go to the hadith the shaykh is saying to us even that though those people have given no importance to the hijab and they've disregarded its importance and some of them are even people attribute themselves to knowledge it's rare you come across a person who's actually talking about the hijab in based on the kitab and the sunnah and the companion statements. You rarely find that, he said. Okay? But then he said, but even though that's the case, there's always a group of people who are steadfast. There's always a ta'ifa, a group of people who are what? 
from the Ummah of the Prophet Qa'imatan bi amri Allah. They are in accordance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands. La yadurruhum, it does not harm them. Man khadalahum, the one who deceived them. Remember, the people who are upon the haqq, the people regard, in their affairs are two types. When a person is upon the truth, you're always going to find the people regarding them is in two parts. The first one is man khadalahum, a person who's going to deceive them. It's the people who are going to deceive you. How are they going to deceive you? They're going to, they're going to tell you, I'm with you, don't worry. And then when, it, when they come in front of the people, they, they won't be on with, you, with you. They walk out on you. They won't support you. They will infiltrate you. They will look for your mistakes and your secrets and your discussions that you've had privately and they'll go and they'll tell the people. They're, they're deceptive. They are what? Anyone who tries to deceive them, anyone who tries to deceive them will not get nowhere. And also there's another group of, of people anyone who opposes them. Some people are going to deceive you and some people are going to oppose you. They're not going to deceive you. They're just going to be opposing you from the get-go. They're going to tell you from the beginning, I'm not with you. Those two groups, Allah told you what? لا يضرهم من خذلهم ولا من خالفهم Those who are أهل الخذلان Who are deceptive to you And those who are in opposition to you Both of them are not going to harm you, inshaAllah ta'ala Don't worry, don't worry If you are steadfast upon the truth You, inshaAllah ta'ala However much you think to yourself that you're a problem, you're in trouble Look at this, they're getting you However much you think that Don't worry Allah will make you the one who is apparent. Maybe whilst you're alive, or even maybe once you, you're long gone and you're dead, that's when he will become it. Then the author says, As-alullah, I ask Allah, أَنْ يَجْعَلَنَا مِنْ هَذِهِ الطَّائِفَةِ That Allah makes us from this group. That Allah makes us from what? He makes us from this group. وَأَنْ يَجْعَلَ هَذِهِ الرسالة. And I ask Allah that he makes this, this risala, this brochure, this book, وَكُلَّ مَا كَتَبْتُ And everything which I have written. Sheikh Nasr is saying this. I ask Allah that he makes this book I've written. And every single book that I have written. وَأَكْتُبُ And which I'm writing. خَالِصًا لِوَجْهِهِ He makes it sincerity for him. He does it what? With sincerity for him. وَسَبَبًا And Allah makes it a means. لِلَيْلِ مَرْضَاتِي To attain Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, being pleased with me. That Allah makes this authorship, these works that I'm doing, a means for Allah to be pleased with me. A means for, me, for Him to be pleased with me. وَالْفَوْزِ بِجَنَّتِي And that He gives me through my works success to Jannah. That He makes me from the inhabitants of Jannah. إِنَّهُ خَيْرُ مَسْؤُولُ Allah is the one, the greatest of him, the one in charge. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the author, rahimahullah, he goes into the conditions of the hijab. The shaykh goes into the conditions of the hijab. And we'll go through each one, inshallah ta'ala. The book is going to be about these conditions. The first condition the author mentions is Isti'abu jami'i al-badani illa mastuthniya. Isti'abu jami'i al-badani illa mastuthni. Any sister, pay attention, who wants to wear a hijab, who wants to cover up, she has to make sure that these conditions are in place. Any one of these conditions, if it's missing, this is not a hijab, uh, sorry, it's not a jilbab. This is not a jilbab, which you were clearly commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first one is, the outer garment worn in public must cover all of the body. And when the author says, Illa mastuthni, except what the Sharia has given exception, he means the face and the hands. So the Sheikh is trying to say here the outer garment worn in public must cover all of the body except the face and the hands. Are we all together? Now, the issue of the face and the hands is a khilafi issue. We're going to come to that, inshallah ta'ala. The second condition is The outer garment 
must not be uh, it must not be a decorative itself or a means of beautification. So the outer garment must, must not be decorative itself or a means of beautification. The third condition that the author Allah he mentions is أَن يَكُونَ صَفِيقًا that he, the outer garment must be thick. It must be what? It must be thick and opaque so as to conceal the clothes worn. Opaque here means that it's not see-through. The fourth is أَن يَكُونَ فَضْفَاضًا غَيْرَ ضَيِّقٍ the fourth one is the outer garment must be wide. Fatfad means that it's wide. And not tight on the woman. Number five. أَلَّا يَكُونَ مُبَخَّرًا مُطَيَّبًا The Muslim woman should not wear perfume. She should not place a perfume wearing it. She should not wear perfume in public. <coughs> Number six. أَلَّا يُشْبِهَ لِبَاسِ الرَّجُلِ the clothes of Muslim women should not resemble men's clothes. Number seven. Allah yushbiha libasul kafirat. The clothes of Mus the clothes of Muslim women should not resemble those of the disbelievers. And last but not least, Allah yakuna libasu shuhra. The clothing of Muslim women should not be obstantatious. It shouldn't be. Meaning, it shouldn't be something that she's using as a form of showing off. It shouldn't be obstantatious, which is shuhra. Any of those eight conditions, is, if one is missing, this is not called a jilbab. And Shaykh Nasir rahimahullah, each one, he brings a whole chapter and the evidence is for it. Where's the evidence going to come from? Where is it going to come from? al Quran, was sunnah and the athar that are transmitted to us and the statements of the what? The companions and the a'imma of Islam. Are we all together? So he's going to make a, the whole book is now going to be revolving around those eight conditions. Are you with me? The whole book, Jilbab al Malat al Muslima, Sheikh Nasir only wrote, wrote it to speak about these eight conditions. What's the Jilbab? These are conditions. Now, some of you might ask, where's the evidence for it? If you listen attentively, you'll find every place evidence. And who preceded him in that understanding? Are we all together? After that, if a person doesn't wear a hijab, Jilbab, then what would we say? The Qur'an, it makes the one in which it wants to give it life, he will give him life. Meaning he will let him live a good life. And those verses and those ahadith that we're going to mention, any woman who chooses not to wear it after that, these verses are only going to be a form of destruction for her. So let her ponder and take these matters very serious. Ash-Shartul Awwal. The author starts with the first condition. The first condition he says, استيعاب جميع البدن إلا ما استثني. The first condition is what? The outer garment worn in public must cover all of the body except the face and the hands. So again, we said the author holds the opinion that the face and the hands are not what they sh they don't have to be covered. Sheikh Nasir doesn't believe that, and we're going to inshallah Taala discuss that with him. Then the author says, he brings his, as he promised us, Sheikh Nasir promised us, he said Al-Quran and then Sunnah and the statements of the ulama, that's exactly what he's going to do. So he's going to start with the Quran. 
He said, so what's these evidence for? This evidence is for that the outer garment worn in public must cover all of the body. These are what the verses is going to use. Some scholars are saying the verses that Sheikh Al-Bani is going to bring are evidences for what? That a woman must cover all of her body unrestrictedly. All of it. Are you there? Sheikh Al-Bani is saying these evidences only prove that a woman has to cover her body, not her face and her hands. These evidences don't show that. Are you there? But they, they all what? They agree on that the rest of the body has to be covered. Pay attention here, brothers and sisters. No scholar in Islam has ever said that the qab is not part of Islam. There's no dispute amongst the ulama. The ulama are by consent in agreement that the niqab is Islam. <coughs> are you with me? That the niqab is part of Islam. But the ulama differ. Is it wajib or is it what? Is it sunnah? There's a khilaf. Do we respect that khilaf? We truly respect that khilaf. If a woman takes the opinion of those scholars who say it's not wajib, we respect her opinion. Are you with me? And those who see it, that the niqab is recommended, they also should not look down at those who say that it's wajib and say you guys are radicals or you guys are extremists. Sah? The matter pertaining to niqab, no scholar in Islam said that it's not part of Islam. Are you with me? The dispute and the argument is, is is it obligatory or is it not? That's the dispute. Some are saying it's obligatory. If the woman doesn't cover her face, she's going to sin. She's, and another group are saying, no, it's recommended. Ah. Even Sheikh Nasir, rahimahullah, is saying himself that if there's fear of fitnah, uh, he's of the opinion that it's not wajib for her to cover her face and hands, but he believes that if it's a fitnah going to come, then she should cover her face and her hands. Are you with me? If a fitness go into a car, from it, she should cover her face and her hands. This is again a place that they agree upon. So now the Sheikh is going to bring the evidences for the, that the outer garment must cover all of the body except the face and the hands. He says, It's in the statement of Allah. In Surah Al-Nur, Ayah 31, Allah says, وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْضُبْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ وَيَحْفَظْنَ فُرُوجَهُنَّ وَيَحْفَظْنَ فُرُوجَهُنَّ وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا وَلِيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُرِهِنَّ عَلَى جُيُوبِهِنَّ وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا لِبُعُولَتِهِنَّ أَوْ آبَائِهِنَّ أَوْ آبَاءِ بُعُولَتِهِنَّ أَوْ آبَائِهِنَّ أَوْ آبَاءِ بُعُولَتِهِنَّ أَوْ أَبْنَائِهِنَّ أو أبناء بعولتهن أو أبناء بعولتهن أو إخوانهن أو بني إخوانهن أو بني إخوانهن أو بني أخواتهن أو نسائهن أو نسائهن أو ما ملكت أيمانهن والتابعين غير أولي الإربة من الرجال أو التابعين غير أولي الإربة من الرجال أو الطفل الذين لم يظهروا على عورات النساء ولا يضربن بأرجلهن 
ليعلم ما يخفين من زينتهم وتوبوا إلى الله جميعا أيها المؤمنون لعلكم تفلحون وقوله تعالى في سورة الأحزاب يا أيها النبي قل لأزواجك وبناتك ونساء المؤمنين يدنين عليهم يدنين عليهن من جلابيبهن ذلك أدنى أن يعرفن فلا يؤذين وكان الله غفورا رحيما الله says in the first ayah وقل say to them نبي الله محمد say to them للمؤمنات say to the believing woman يغضبنا in the Arabic language this is a fi'l which is مجزوم uh, it's a fi'l which is مجزوم يغضضنا and it is مجزوم because of a جواب which is which is a جواب الطلب which is محذوف which was اغضضنا lower your gaze women uh, and then the ayah after that says so when they are commanded وقل للمؤمنات say to the believing woman اغضضنا lower your gaze فَيَغْضُضْنَا Then they will lower their gaze. That's where يَغْضُضْنَا comes from. It comes from أُغْضُضْنَا Lower your gaze. And then Allah is telling us that they have lowered their gaze. So the thing that's making this fi'il majzum is a jawabu talab which is mahdhuf which is أُغْضُضْنَا وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ Say to the believing women يَغْضُضْنَا Lower your gaze. مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ Lower your gaze. The lowering your gaze here, the min here. If you look at the ayah, يَغْضُضْنَا مِنْ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ Allah has used the word min. The min here in the Arabic language is تَبْعِضِيَّ It's what? تَبْعِضِيَّ What does تَبْعِضِيَّ mean? It means lower your gaze in some of the issues. Not every time. No. It's only from the pray. Some women you're not allowed to look at. You can look at your mom. You can look at your sister. You can look at your wife. Etc. Are you with me? So the here, يَغْضُضْنَا مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ That lower your gaze in some issues. مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ Here is تَبْعِضِيَّ Because not every prohibited things, do you, uh, I'm sorry, not, not from everything, do you lower your, every woman, do you lower your gaze from Sahih? Because the ayah mentions those we're allowed to look at. Ibn Kathir said regarding this ayah, in his tafsir, he says, هَذَا أَمْرُ مِنَ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى this ayah is a command from Allah Ta'ala لِلْنِسَاءِ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ To the believing women وَغَيْرَةٌ مِّنْهُ لِأَزْوَاجِهِنَّ And it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having ghira for these women for their husbands عِبَادِهِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ His believing uh, uh, slaves Allah is the one who's, who has ghira for them subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he commanded them, he said Ibn Kathir, وَتَمْيِيزُ لَهُنَّ Allah wants to distinguish them. عَنْ صِفَةِ لِسَاءِ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ وَفِعَالَاتُ الْمُشْرِكَاتِ He wants to distinguish them from the description and the characteristics of the pre-Islamic women. And he wants to distinguish them from the what? وَفِعَالَاتُ الْمُشْرِكَاتِ And the doings of the pagans and the polytheists. Allah wants them to be different from them. So what do you hear is taking this ayah? That this is a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what is this command? What's the command? The command here, my beloved brothers and sisters, is what? For the woman to lower her gaze. And also for the woman to cover up. Any woman who comes with that has what? She has distinguished herself. وَتَمْيِيزُ لَهُنَّ عَنْ صِفَةِ نِسَاءِ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ You've distinguished yourself from the pre-Islamic women. And you've taken your way, yourself away from وَفِعَالَاتُ الْمُشْرِكَاتِ And the doings of the disbelievers. 
This hijab is an identity. It's what you represent. You're meant to be seen from far and known that you're a Muslim woman. That's how you identify that this individual is a Muslim woman. That she's different from them. She's covered. This is a symbol and an alama to know that she's a what? She's a mu'minah, a believer. She's a Muslim. She's been distinguished from them. يَغْضُضْنَا مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ Ibn Kathir also mentioned when he was speaking about يَغْضُضْنَا مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ lowering the gaze. Ibn Kathir said وَلِهَذَا ذَهَبَ كَثِيرٌ مِنَ الْعُلَمَاء And because of this, many of the scholars, they've taken the view إِلَىٰ أَنَّهُ لَا يَجُوزُ لِلْمَرْأَةِ أَنْ تَنْظُرَ إِلَىٰ الْأَجَانِبِ That it's not permissible for a woman to look at a man إِلَىٰ الْأَجَانِبِ To a foreigner, a man who's not a mahram بِشَهْوَةٍ with desires وَلَا بِغَيْرِ شَهْوَةٍ And even without desires أَصْلًا She's not allowed to look at him. Some of the ulama they took from this وَلِهَذَا ذَهَبَ كَثِيرُ مِنَ الْعُلَمَاءِ He said Many of the scholars have taken the opinion from this verse directly that it is not permissible for a woman to look at a man that's a foreigner to her, whether it is based on desires or whether it is without desires, aslan whatsoever. It's not permissible for her. And also he mentions that there are another group of scholars. So before I go to the second group of scholars, this first group of scholars, what did they use? What was there? What was their evidence? The evidence that they use is the hadith of Umm Salama and Aisha. That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Tirmidhi narrated in his sunan, in Sanad al-Hasan. That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sitting and Abdullah ibn, Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoub, the blind companion, kept walking. He kept walking towards the what? He kept walking towards the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he came, Umm Salama and Aisha didn't wear their hijab. Did they cover up? No, they didn't cover up. And when they didn't cover up, the Prophet ﷺ said to them, cover up. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, he's blind. This companion is a what? He's a blind companion. He doesn't see us. And then the Prophet said, Are you guys, are you two blind? Are you two blind? You two, are you two blind? No. Can you see him? Ha, cover up for me. Cover up from him. So they took from that, that they, the women, have to shield and cover themselves from the man, regardless of what the situation is. Whether it's shahwa, whether it's without shahwa. Then Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum was blind, he can't even see, he's got no, there's no shahwa look for him, because he can't see them, aslan. But they were still told to not look at him. Are you there? And the Prophet stopped. He said, you guys cover up from him. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? So what would they do? They would go away from the gathering. They're not allowed to look at him. Those, that's what one group of scholars used. The next group of scholars, they said that a woman is allowed to look at a man without shahwa. She looks at him with desires. That is what? Haram. And they all agree on that. They all agree if it's desires, it's haram. But if, but if it's without desires, it is what? It is permissible. It's what? It is permissible. And the scholars who use that, they use the argument of when Aisha, the Abyssinian men were playing and she was watching it over the Prophet's shoulder alayhi salatu wasalam, and they were jumping. And, the, and they were throwing their arrows and their spears. The Prophet would say to Aisha, are you done every now and then? If she, and she's like, no, I still want to watch it. And he, she would carry watching. And then he said, Aisha, are you finished? She's like, no, nope, I still want to watch it. So they said she was looking at men, Aisha. She was watching them. Are you there? Nawawi in his Sahih, Sahih Muslim, and Imam Nawawi in his Sahih, he says, that even this hadith of Aisha is not a proof for you guys. The great Shafi'i scholar, Nawawi, Abu Zakariya Nawawi says it's not a proof for you guys. Why? He said Aisha was only permitted and allowed to look at the, the men that were in front of her. But she's not allowed to look at one individual per se, one individual, focus on him. They are Jews. 
She can look at, at an activity that's happening in front of her. But to focus on one individual, look at him. That's what the prohibition is out there, he said, no way. Are you with me? People who are there, I mean, okay, they're men a lot. And later you're asked, who is there? I don't know, I just saw a lot of people there. That look is no problem. And that is what Aisha Hadith shows. She, they said, are you there? Are you with me? And the uh, ayah Zahir Nawawi mentions, Nawawi mentions Allah Ta'ala that there are two opinions within the Madhab al-Shafi'iyya regarding looking at a woman, a woman looking at a man, a man. There's one view that says it's disliked and another view that says that it's haram. And Nawawi says, well, the one that's strongest is that it's haram. That a woman is not allowed to look at a man. She's not allowed to look at a She's not allowed to look at a, a man. Here, my beloved brothers and sisters, there's something that needs to be studied. The view that says that a woman, nor a man, can look at, pay attention, a man cannot look at a woman. That's the correct opinion. And the woman is not allowed to look at a man at all, is the correct opinion. Are you there? Okay, Jamil. But there's a mas'ala that needs to be understood properly. And that is, if something is made haram, not because it's haram in and within itself. It's not haram in and within itself. This thing is not muharramun lidati. It's a what? Saddal lidari'ah. It's prohibited because it's going to lead to a problem. Are you with me? Does that make sense? For instance, looking at a woman, is it haram in and within itself or is it haram because it's going to lead to zina? No, it's haram because it's going to lead to zina. You know why? That it's not haram in and within itself. That same woman that you are not allowed to look at, you are now permitted to look at her when you want to get married to her. And that is going to lead to marriage. Sah? Now that this looking is going to lead to marriage, what did the Sharia allow you to do? Are you with me, brothers and sisters? What did the Sharia do? It has permitted for you to look at her. Are you there? It has permitted for the man to go out of his way and to look at the woman. Good. So what the scholars, is marriage a darura? Is it a darura? Is marriage a necessity? Yeah? Yeah? No, marriage is not a life and death situation. Some of you guys say, yeah, it's a darura. May Allah make it easy for you guys to get married, inshaAllah ta'ala, brothers. Yeah. May Allah make it if it's a darura. May Allah make it easy for you guys. Ah. But what is it? Marriage is a haja. Haja means what? It's a need. It's not a, ne it's not a necessity. It's a... It's a not a necessity. It's a need. Jameel. If that's the case... The scholars, they say, this man was allowed to go and look at this woman, not because of darura. He was allowed to go and look at her because of a hajj. Are you with me? Are we all together? So the, there's a qa'idah which they took from, which is anything that's made permissible. Anything that's made haram because of what it's going to lead to. It is made permissible when there is a need for it. It doesn't have to reach necessity. But if something is haram in and within itself, it's haram in and within itself, then there has to be a necessity for it. There's no other way it would be made permissible. It's khamar haram in and within itself. Ah. There's no other way to drink khamar except if there's a what? If there's a necessity. Does that make sense? But if something is made, if something is what? Is pictures haram? According to the opinion I personally follow, his pictures are haram. But then you've got passport and you have license. Naam, pictures are not haram in and within itself. It's haram for what? Because it's going to lead to shirk. Sahih. If there comes a need for the picture and it's going to lead to something which is good, such as verification of my identity, if another black Somalian comes and says, I'm Abdurrahman, and he takes all my money in my account, which I don't have much. Yeah, it's a problem. I need to tell them, this is my face here. When I go through the airport, 
If somebody does something wrong, goes to another wrong country, I no, it's me. Here I am. Yeah. <coughs> so if something is haram because of what it's going to lead to, it is made permissible when there's a need. There's only a need for it. But if something is haram in and within itself, it's haram. In and within itself, not because of what it's going to lead to, but it's haram in and within itself. It's made permissible for what? If there's a necessity. So a woman is allowed to look at a man if there's studying involved. She's learning the religion. She's going to a shop and she's buying. It's not a necessity, but there's a hajja here. She goes to a shop and the guy's on behind the till and, and he, go, he says to five pounds and she does this. No. She doesn't do that. She goes to the till, the man says five pounds. Okay, here's your five pounds. There's a hajja here. There's a need to buy and sell. She looks at him. He looks at her, no problem. Are you with me? If she's at a studying place and the teacher's in front of her, she puts her hand up. She says, teacher, can I ask a question? No problem. She says, a hajja for it. Are we you together? There's a hajja for it, there's a need for it, she does that. Are we all together? It doesn't have to reach a necessity. Just the same way if a man wants to get married to her, he sees her face. She makes it permissible for him. Uh, but the man doesn't, this um, etiquette where brothers go to a, a meeting for marriage and then they ask the sister, can you lift your niqab up? Okay, this is not, that's not the purpose of what the meeting should be. A man should see the woman without her permission. That's what he do, does. He's meant to see her without her knowledge. Are you with me, brothers? Why? For two reasons. Number one, it's, it goes against her shyness when you say to her, I need to see your face. And she's shy, methana. And she does. She uncovers her face and she's shy. That's not uh, good. And she should not be in a position where she, remo- she gets rid of her shyness. Are you there? Second thing is that the purpose behind this look is to see this woman, how she looks in her day-to-day situation. Ah, in her day-to-day affairs, this is what you're meant to know, because this is what you're going to be dealing with. But not on the day when she gets ready for the meeting. I'm to marry. I'll conclude there, inshaAllah ta'ala, anything which I have said that was wrong is for me, shaitan, and Allah and his messenger are free from it. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illallah, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayhi.